excuse or unexcused, and then we can go from there. Yes. Okay, sounds good. So I have Marie Arbro, I have Lily, I have Dwayne Bolt, and then not on the school board, I have Heather Webster, I have Julie, I have Mark, and I have Barb, and Christy may join us, I think. <laughs> um, so then I have the approval of minutes. Move to approve. Second. Absolutely. Dwayne. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All right. I think I don't see any. Um, so all those in favor? Um, Lily. Yes, I'm approved. Marie. Approved. Dwayne. Approve. And Robin Sue approves. Christy, I'm assuming is not still there. Correct. Okay. She's not there. All right. So that's um, unanimous. Robin Sue, if I may. Um, yes. Public comment. I, I don't have any to report, but I'm going to go on to my other screen. Okay. And just check with Selena uh, to see if anything was received. Uh, okay. After and certainly if we do get anything, we'll report it out afterwards. Okay, and Christy had said she hadn't yet as of this afternoon, so. Um, and then Barb, principal's report. Okay. So, I've got to find. <laughs> got too many screens open, I'm sorry. Barb, there's two of you. I don't know, am I the only person that says marks? I think no, I'm trying to get out of one meeting computer. so I can see another, hold on. Yeah, we got a double Barb, and I'm telling you, one of you is, is, is a godsend. More than enough. <laughs> Okay, I apologize. I've been, um, several people have been trying to text me and email me during the meeting. So I just wanted to double check and make sure um, nothing big was going on. So, um, so let's start really. Um, there is a second confirmed case of COVID in the eighth grade. Um, we just found that out uh, about an hour before school closed. Um, it is linked, it is related. The two individuals had been together at an outside entertainment venue. Um, I'm not outside, meaning off island. I don't know if it was outside or inside. I wasn't privy to that information. But um, we are gonna continue to um, you know, keep the eighth grade class out. So two out of the three homerooms have been affected. Um, seventh grade will come back in Wednesday. During the weekend, as normal protocol, Tammy, our custodian, comes in and wipes down all of the wind, uh, all of the doorknobs, the light switches, front and back of the seats, underneath the seats, um, the tabletops or desks, et cetera. So that was all done. And then in addition today, we just swamped everything again and then um, are spraying tonight before people um, leave while it's empty. And we'll do the same thing again tomorrow. So we're feeling like the protocols um, have been followed and everybody's doing a great job with that. I also want to say that um, when we started, it, you know, heads, we have done um, things really, really well. I'm very, very proud of what we've done. And, and we did get, you know, um, a nice shout out from the hospital. But I want you to know we received the call at two o'clock, yes, or the email at two o'clock yesterday. Um, we had Melissa V um, was gracious enough to immediately start with CDC. Then we did, um, then when we still hadn't heard back from CDC on a particular um, question, we made the determination that Heather Webster would start calling seventh grade and Melissa would call eighth grade. Now it's important to know that seventh grade did not need to be put on remote. But because they are in the same wing on the same floor, I made the decision that in, you know, just out of an abundance of caution, I wanted them out because I just, you know, at that point, we didn't know totally what we were dealing with on a Sunday. So I think our protocols have gone really well. I'm really pleased with what's happening. I am so thankful to our families that those who have siblings have said, Barb, you know, Melissa, Heather, we're going to keep our kids at home. Um, and so they have been 
isolating themselves. Um, so I don't think we could ask for a better situation with our families and with the school. Having said that, it is very scary to the staff and to the community. Um, and we're just gonna take it one day at a time. We will have approximately 15 staff members quarantined tomorrow. And it's mostly isolated to one building, but it does start including the specials teachers. So wow. if we find that we have another positive come up um, that's not related to this case, then I and it's in the other building, then I think we're gonna to have to have a serious conversation of going remote. My concern is if we do go to remote, I would wanna to go to remote, I'm gonna be right up front for the 10 days and probably till Christmas vacation. The two cases that we have been dealing with, it's really important people know the symptoms were so mild, the doctor even said, there's no way these are gonna come back positive and they did. So my concern is that we may have asymptomatic kids walking around or kids with very mild symptoms that aren't reporting because they, you know, hey, it's only a scratchy throat, it's because I'm wearing my mask, that we're gonna just keep perpetuating having symptoms and, you know, kids have it in the building. And so this grade could be out, you know, for 10 days. Oh, we found something in this grade. This grade or two grades are going to be out for, you know, a different 10 days. Oops, you know, we've got another group out for a different 10 days. And I think unless you really do a hard shutdown, if we have both buildings involved, that we're not going to get rid of it. Um, I would want to continue to talk to CDC and to um, the health, you know, care professionals. But I really, the more I'm reading and the more I'm seeing, I, I do have that concern. So I'll keep you posted on that. Is it my first choice? No. But is it the right choice? Yes. If we really want to stay with in-person um, learning, I think at some point we really, really do, do need to look at more than a one or two day shutdown if, again, it involves both buildings. Any questions? Uh, Barb, um, do I remember something that there was like, it had to do with three people, non-family that that, is that just considered yes. an outbreak or does that, can, are they, do they recommend that you shut down after that? that you're, you're exactly right. That after three, uh, and, and we just had a conversation about this and I want to verify with CDC because the, there are two different interpretations. So one interpretation is three, three positives no matter what yes shut down the other interpretation is three unrelated cases then shut down and so right now depending on who you ask we either have two cases or we have one related case okay okay but thank you for clarifying that Bob. hey Barb. Bob. <clears throat> well i'm sorry go ahead Dwayne. go ahead mark oh i, oh, okay. I was wondering if that if the three is adjusted for population, like a larger school, is it more than three or is it three no matter what, no matter how many kids there are? My understanding is it's three, which is interesting. So we, we talked about this, Barb, with the nurse and the hospital. Um, we, had, um, we had three, four administrators on that um, Zoom, uh, two hospital um, uh, individuals and, and two nurses. and. The consensus was three is our threshold and um, at, at this time. Is that accurate, Bob? I think so. I mean, I, I, I didn't mean, want to go out on a limb and say that, but that would be my threshold, yeah. three related for, for or that, unrelated. For that school, for that yeah. school, yes. Given where we're at with resources, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I'd just like to take an opportunity um, to give a shout out to Barb, to Melissa, to Heather, her staff. They're doing the right thing. There's no guessing game here. We are following our framework. We're following our procedures. Uh, Barb has done an impeccable job, as has Melissa through this. This is exhausting work, but we're we're doing it by the book, and they're not. And no one is doing it in a vacuum. We have a great team. Uh, Barb won't tell you this, but we've already started a document, or she started a document with lessons learned. Um, and when we have these situations um, come up, we're networking with all of our administrators. 
our nurses. We have meetings set up tomorrow for lessons learned. So I, I want to reassure not only the school committee, but the public, the staff, um, this, this is hard information, but what we're doing are the right things and we're doing it with the medical professionals taking the lead. Barb, anything to add to that? Because I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, words matter and people are concerned, but yeah. I want to reassure people that Barb and her team are doing a great job and they're doing the right thing. And there's no second guessing here. Yeah, I guess I would just end it with two things, Mark. One, there's no way I would allow the building to be open if I didn't feel it were safe. Uh, and, and I, you know, even if I were bucking up against lots of people, I would be vocal in saying if I didn't think it was safe. Um, and I base that on my work right now with sci the scientist and the medical professionals because they're in the know. And, um, and the second part is I'm always going to err on caution, you know, being, being realistically cautious. And I don't want to say common sense. What I'm going to say is realistically cautious. Um, and that's, uh, that's the way that I think Heather, Melissa and I have approached this. And it's, you know, we are so fortunate to have a team of three to be able to bounce ideas off of one another because is, you know, we, we're constantly saying, is this your interpretation? Is this your interpretation? The one of the piece, things, what, go ahead. Sorry, Bob. The only piece I'd add is, is for the staff, students and parents and uh, what really drives this process are our school nurses. It's not mm -hmm. the superintendent making a decision that overrides uh, the nurses and the CDC. They drive what we do and don't do. Excuse me, Barb. No, that's all right. Um, and I, a huge shout out to Melissa, um, our school nurse, because she had put together notebooks for, for Heather, myself, for her, um, and the two secretaries. And it included all of the class lists, all of the protocols, all of the scripts, all of the standing operating procedures for Maine and for the district, the bus list, the um, specialist schedules, the, uh, you know, already, you know, lots of different things. And so we were able to quickly, we had all the information at hand, we were able to quickly go through it and notify our families. And um, we're in the process of putting together just a protocol like that so that other principals can, and their nurses can have all of the same things in a notebook. I mean, because that, that saved us so much time. There was no going back into school. There was no trying to figure it out from power school. We had all of the information at our hands. So I, have Lee, was, I see Lily has a question and then Christy. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for for dealing with these things on Sundays. I know when it was happening in my family, it was a weekend also. And, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm curious, just the timeline of when, when was the event and when did these, the kids get sick? And are, are we just kind of waiting for more kind of thing? Like I, I'm, I, I get so confused about the CDC and how, how we you yeah. are either a, a confirmed you know, possible, yeah. whatever. A, a detectable or non-detectable, I yeah. think is what they're trying to use now. So um, what we know is that um, two students um, attended an event uh, a week ago last Friday. So it would have been okay. the um, prior to the 30th. So I, I guess it would have been that Friday before Thanksgiving with that. I mean, after Thanksgiving, would that be right? Yeah. Um, and so one student was actually out the Monday and Tuesday um, that we returned, so the 30th and the 1st, and then came in on Wednesday, was symptom free. Thursday, uh, Thursday had a scratchy throat, nurse decided to send her home before noon um, and never came in on Friday. The second student, as we understand, um, started to have symptoms, we think on Saturday, but it's not confirmed at this point. We're still, we're still trying to figure that one out. The other thing I should mention that I wanna make sure everybody's aware of is that the two classrooms that are impacted right now, the two eighth grade homerooms that are impacted right now, those students all have to have a PCR test before returning to school. So they can't go to Walgreens and get the quick fix bio, bio, I always say it wrong, but you know the test I mean. Um, they have to go through their PCP 
and get the PCR testing. And it has to be done. Kate was hoping that um, those kids would be done either Wednesday or Thursday of this week, because that would be given them in the five to seven day range when they would be most apt to show symptoms and or um, the bug in the, in the system. So that's a little bit different information um, than what I think some people were thinking that they could just go to Walgreens and get an okay and, and life was fine. Um, it's not. And the other nice thing, um, shout out to the hospital is we're asking families if we can share the names of the students with the hospital so that once the family calls the PCP and the provider calls it into the COVID tent or whatever, their name is already there, so they get priority. They're getting priority. And the same thing with our staff. So that's a huge help to us because it is going to be, you know, the turnaround time is, is right now still about five days. Christy? Um, I have two comments. One, um, that's great news about putting those kids' name on the list, but I am aware that the high school kids who are quarantining are being given the runaround by their PCPs and not being given the test, all of them, because they don't have symptoms. So even though you're being asked to get the tests, the doctor's offices locally are not yet stepping up to give the kids the test. So I'm that's not, a good, I'm, that's good that's because good. Kate Worcester actually had just called me um, prior to this meeting and I'm calling her back. Um, but I will mention that to her that the high school students right. are getting the runaround. Yep. I have a message right now from one high school mother whose son cannot get the test because he doesn't have symptoms. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say, um, sorry, I was late and I don't know that you covered this, but you know, Barbara and I've been talking and, uh, I think Barb is making the excellent choices. I think her, her and Mark have made the right decisions, but I also, I told Barb, I fully support um, that if she feels it's necessary to shut down, I 100% um, support her decision. Uh, she's dealing right now with some very anxiety ridden staff members and teachers. And, and I think we all could agree that even though we think it's ideally best for students to be in school and our communities, these kids are not gonna be learning if all of their teachers are anxious and nervous and and worried. And so I know that Barb is in the building and she's got her pulse on that situation, but I just, I just wanted to let, you know, you know how I'm feeling too, that um, I support that, that she knows what's best for her staff and her students. And I told her if she needs to make the call, they need to make the call. And so if you rest of you want to weigh in, I just told her she has my full support to, you know, if, if that's what she thinks is best. Mine too. Thanks, Christy. I, I would agree. Christy, if I can give a shout out, I'm behind that 1000%. Great. So if there aren't any other questions about what's going on, we'll do a quick um, principles report so then we can get to the budget. Um, so we, um, again, we'll be doing benchmark testing for all of our staff except for those in quarantine on Wednesday um, at the high school between seven and 9.30 in the morning. And then after, after that, I think in two weeks, we'll be doing 20% um, of our, or 20 people on our staff. And we have chosen um, a team member from each grade level, representatives in each building from support staff, special ed staff, um, office staff, custodians. So I think I think we've got a pretty good um, pulse on the different uh, different folks, different categories in our building. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, school picture retake day is December 9th. Um, shout out again to Heather, who is our uh, entertainment queen. She's our organizer. So we've had pajama day, dress alike, but the best part is we're now having 12 days of Connors Emerson. And today we were celebrating Tina and Laurel, our cooks, and we'll be celebrating each of the different um, groups of folks in our building for the next 12 days. We also worked really hard to give our um, teachers an extra planning period prior to the Thanksgiving break. And so we had a duct tape competition and marshmallow and toothpick competition. And um, I know that the staff were really appreciative and that the students um, enjoyed doing something a little bit different. So that was good. 
So far, we have eight students who are looking to return to in-person learning. Um, I think we're gonna be able to accommodate most of them, um, but we're still looking into um, how many openings we have in each classroom and, and where. Um, town halls, I can't say enough about the hospital and Jackson Lab. They have done an amazing job offering the, the school staff and the administrators um, just top-notch um, information that's digestible, that's helpful. Um, call us at any point in time. Here's our cell phone numbers. What do you need from us? It has been, um, it, it actually has been a delight working with them. And, and I just say that because I know so many communities do not have that wonderful relationship with their hospitals and their scientists. So um, again, that's, that's just been great. The next one is actually, oh, I'm sorry, Jax is um, going to be holding a student town hall for mostly middle schoolers on December 15th. It's going to be virtually. Um, and it will be taped, but I think that's gonna be a lot of fun for the kids. For academic updates real quickly, our NAEP testing, which is the federal testing, um, we're always randomly chosen, has actually been postponed as of last week. Um, up until last week, they had planned on sending folks into the buildings to do this testing, but they will not be doing that. Um, under academic updates, if you have a chance to, um, to hit the live link on the grade five charter, you really should. Um, our grade five students came up with what they felt were student rights and more importantly, responsibilities, what their responsibilities were as learners. And Jaylene Roths, um, who's one of our long-term subs, um, had them do this project and it was outstanding. Winter sports, you should know that Brian is working with Bunky and they're just following the MDOE guidelines. At this point, we will not be doing anything until January, um, pre you know, the weekend. That was last Friday, the decision. So before we even knew we had COVID in the building, we had planned on not doing anything until January. Um, professional development. There's an online course with Lynn Lyons, Helping Anxious Kids. It's a certification training on anxiety and treatment for children and adolescents. And it's a wonderful course um, and it's online. It's self-paced. So we have, I think, 12 staff members who are interested in taking that. Um, we've got math webinars going, MindFlow, which is the social emotional learning, um, and again, the COVID town halls. PTSA, boy, you know, talk about a, a wonderful organization that's meeting virtually each month. Um, they have been so instrumental in helping families in need, whether it's the food, um, helping with food, or whether it's getting them um, what they need for the holidays. They're right now, uh, I, you know, we're identifying families um, anonymously and they're going out and purchasing gift cards so that parents can go out and purchase presents and, and what they need to, to get through the holidays. So it's been amazing. I want you to know that um, there have been some virtual support meetings and our school nurse, Melissa Bishop and Edie Dubois, the school social worker have been asked to hold those visual support parent meetings. Um, so those virtual academy kids um, uh, par and parents have been uh, working with Melissa and Edie. And um, there is a COVID holiday planning and self-care um, opportunity coming up with Chris McLaughlin in December that all parents are able to zoom in on. Um, building and maintenance, we could just continue to clean and organize and build the outside areas. Our CRRF funds have purchased um, some portable basketball hoops, some cornhole, boards, um, balls, et cetera. Uh, the PPE is still in great shape. In fact, we're gonna be receiving a shipment of um, medical grade N95 masks from the state this week. And, and you know, for those of you who keep hearing about these poor states that the hospitals can't even get N95s, here our state is sending them to the school, which I think is just phenomenal. Uh, food service, we continue to do a great job with that. And Tina now is offering hot offerings. I don't know if any of your kids have been talking about it, but um, she's done a great job as, you know, working with Laurel. She's still putting out 45 boxes of food a week for families to come and pick up. Um, and in addition to just serving the hot lunch and 
the kitchen staff is down one position. So we have people that will just show up for an hour or two and help Tina when, when they can. So that's been wonderful. Um, lastly, um, the installation of the new fiber between the buildings um, happened uh, November 30th to December 2nd. This was again done with the CRF funding and we have um, now been able to get better access outside um, when we're outside doing activities with technology. So I think that's it. If anybody has any questions or if Heather, you have anything to add. Are we good? I have a question, Barb, if nobody else yep. does. Um, on the December 15th town hall with the kids, are the kids gonna be able to actually view that in real time and ask questions or how is that um, gonna We're work hoping so. It's, it's, it is just before their lunch, but we're hoping to rearrange things so that they can. Okay. So, uh, that, that's the intent anyways, Robin, so yep. Okay, that's great. Let's see, I don't see, I don't see any other questions. Um, Christy, do you have a chair report? Um, I just had, I had, uh, two things. Um, one that we are, um, meeting with the teachers, uh, soon to begin talking about contract negotiations. So just let you guys know. Um, and we've also, Mark and I have also been, uh, in contact with, uh, the Connors Emerson support staff. So that that's moving along. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention, um, that I hadn't had a chance to yet was, as you all know, like a, a month ago now, or maybe it was three weeks ago, the, the school board did receive a letter from the Teachers Association um, regarding public comment and future meetings and, and our protocols moving forward. And I just wanted to put it in the public record here on the, on the school board meetings that that letter was received. It was distributed to all school board members and, uh, and we appreciate the, the input from the Teachers Association and, and we look you know, forward to moving forward. So uh, I just wanted, I, I hadn't uh, mentioned that letter publicly yet. And so I just want to make sure it made it into meeting minutes. And uh, then that's all, that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Christy. Um, so moving on to budget. Oh, thank you. I've got to pull up my screen here. Um, so you should, have, did everybody have a chance to get the budget and open it up? I guess that's the first question. Did that work? Okay. So um, I had a chance to go back a little bit and change some things. Um, the first thing is I, I'm going to recommend that we continue with a full-time custodian. I, I think that's just a must. Um, I'm also recommending that we add two teachers. Um, no matter what, next year, we are either going to need substantial RTI services or we're gonna to need to continue with low student pods because of COVID. And right now we're just barely making ends meet doing what we're doing. So um, that's a price, price, you know, it's a, it's a hefty price tag, but I just, um, I don't see any other way around it. My initial recommendation had been to add four positions. And right now um, I'm gonna scale that back to two positions. Um, that, uh, let's see, student supports and co-curricular. I'm putting $20,000 in there. That can be negotiated, um, you know, if you think that, that that should come out. But again, I'm looking at, you know, we're, we really are gonna need to, to step up some student supports as far as mental health. Um, we're, we really do need to offer some more activities for kids, you know, who may be not able to get out athletically, et cetera. I, you know, I, I don't want to be a dooms and gloom kind of person, but I don't see that we're going to get out of this much before mid next year. I think we're going to, I think the vaccines are going to come, but they're not going to come until, you know, maybe the middle of the summer, what I'm hearing. Um, Pfizer just announced that instead of 100 million doses, they're down to 50 million doses. So I just, you know, I'm just trying to be as realistic as I can um, in trying to forecast forward. And I cut out the additional spaces. I think right now we're okay. We still, if we have to have the music room and the library and the tech room that we could use for classroom spaces if we absolutely needed to. Um, wouldn't be my first choice, but those areas are available. 
And um, as far as, you know, the heating oil, I think we can absorb that. Um, HVAC and service, I think that could come out of your CIP, out of your project areas. Um, cleaning supplies, I think we could, you know, figure that out. And technology, I took that out as well because we've been able to, to purchase quite a bit um, and upgrade quite a bit with our technology through the CRF funds. So um, if you look at your budget, Nancy did include all of those um, in and uh, let's see, I think you're looking at a 7%, seven something percent um, budget. So any questions? Other than that, I should note that that supplies, um, everything is, is standard quo. We're not adding any new programs other than, again, positions. We're not adding, you know, any new rooms of furniture or anything like that. It's, it's just really budget to budget. Christy, I see you have a question. Um, Barb, first off, does this budget include the, the most recent uh, figures from the, the superintendent's office? Um, what it does include, um, Christy, is a 10% increase to whatever our formula is. So I will be recommending that we don't adopt a budget tonight, that we wait and come back on December 21st, because we will have hopefully firmer figures after the AOS meeting on the 14th. Okay. And, and, uh, and I, I don't want to say this to be, you know, the jerk in the room, but I have some you know, I'm, I'm really nervous about the high cost of those increases at the AOS budget level and how they all trickle down. And, you know, I'm, and, and all of them are needed expenses. I'm, I'm not even opposed. I, I know how badly we need the, the operational support staff position. And, um, but my, and I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we've budgeted you know, too high of an increase. Uh, looking around, it seems like everybody's health insurance increases for next year. Are, are low. And so I think 10% is, is probably a lot higher than we're going to see. And so hopefully that, that money, that number comes down. And so we're not looking at such a high increase everywhere, but, but what makes me nervous as, as every year is, you know, approving that AOS level budget in January, and then, you know, finding out our, our insurance increases at 1%, but we've already factored that money in and we can't take it out. Um, at that at that level, which is I know smaller than our local level, and so I would, and I know this is not where we're going to talk about it, Mark, but I'm I'm would like more information about the asymptomatic testing and and how wise or unwise that program might be because we are budgeting so much money toward that program for next year, and it I don't know that we can afford it, and so I have. You know, I, I don't want to see Connors Emerson cut out these positions that we so desperately need to fund asymptomatic testing at the AOS level. Um, and, and I know that sounds horrible and, and maybe teachers and staff members want to give me input and say, no, we absolutely want this, need this. Um, but I would love to hear some more um, information maybe at the AOS meeting supporting or, or not supporting that, that expense. And uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Mark. That's all. Mark, do you want to respond? Oh, there you are. Yes. Well, no, not necessarily respond, but just thank Christy. Um, this, this budget request couldn't come at a worse time. And I'm very conscious of that. And, you know, um, I'll just say I, I really struggled last year with bringing that request forward. And then at the 11th hour, we, we pulled it for um, the school psychologist and social emotional supports, which I believe was the right thing to do. Uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I want to emphasize, and, and I agree with you, Christy, the, you know, it's, it's kind of like insurance. Um, and, and I do plan on addressing this at the AOS level, so I'll be brief. But the, uh, I think the testing is the right thing to do. It's, it's recommended by uh, external um, partners. And so we'll, we'll have some background and information on that. And th there's a couple ways to go about that, but we, we don't have to get into that now. We can talk about that Monday. And, and secondly is, you know, yeah, timing is everything. 
And this operations management position, which represents really the bulk outside of the testing of the request is really born out of, I can't emphasize enough, um, the support for our building principals and building level leaders, as well as uh, the great people we have working with us now. Um, this position is not to supplant, take away anybody's um, authority or capacity. It's really about the things we've been talking about and that we've done with teaching and learning, and that's networking and collaboration. So um, these are hard questions, and I'm glad you're putting it out there because the public really needs to weigh in as to where they want to see the priorities. Um, first and foremost, it always has to be in the classroom. And, um, you know, that goes without saying. I think the last several years, if you, and when we go back and, and we can be proud of this and proud of the work Nancy's done and Barb and all the principals, the AOS has really held their uh, belt tight as an organization, but we are at a crossroads. And so um, I welcome that conversation and we'll be ready for that with some information that will help people process. So um, I, I think another I, way I, I can't emphasize enough that the priority for me is to, um, um, make sure that we, we have supports in the classroom, but I do think we need to think big picture as well. Thank you. Um, and, and I just add that, you know, I, I quickly just added up the figures and you're looking at roughly $38,000 increase to um, Bar Harbor's budget with the AOS. And that's a half a percentage point, um, just to kind of keep everything in perspective. I, I do think um, without a doubt that the operations um, manager is a position that we really need to look at seriously. Will it benefit Bar Harbor as much as some of the other towns? No. And, and the reason I say that is only because we have contracted bus servicing. And I, I'm going to be very honest in saying our contract with SEER is up this year. And knowing how difficult it is for them to get drivers, I worry about the fact that they may not even bid on um, on this service another year. So it, although right now it may not benefit us hugely, it sure could in a very short time. And um, I, I just, you know, need you to, to be aware of that. Okay. Marie, your hand is up. Yeah, Barb, can you, um, you mentioned that you took out the stuff for space, but mm -hmm. what, what did you take out and what is the outside, now I can't find it, um, the part that was added in, oh, there it is, um, develop outside areas. Is that, what, what is the difference between what you took out and what, what's in there? Okay, so, um, and, I, and again, to be really clear, Marie, we hadn't put it in the budget. It was just sort of the, the, the wish list that we presented the and then, customs, right? right, exactly. And at one point um, you, you folks had asked that we put it all in the budget so you could see clearly how much it would cost and, and what the impact was. So again, um, I feel, and that's why I mentioned that I felt like right now we don't need the portable classrooms because we're not moving around campus like we had been. So we can still access the library and the music room and the tech room if we need additional classroom space. Um, otherwise, portable classrooms right now would be probably $100,000. Um, the outside area, we were gifted $20,000 uh, and we're gonna use that in conjunction with some of our COVID money to just add some, we've purchased some uh, playground equipment with the COVID money but we also would like to build sort of a permanent gazebo fixture. Um, we have ordered three portable gazebo, um, sturdy gazebos um, with metal roofs and, and um, wooden siding, uh, wooden um, supports, but those can be moved. And because of the planning board and the need to plan ahead, we just didn't have time to get code enforcement, et cetera on a permanent kind of um, couple gazebos. So we're gonna use the portable gazebos, which um, Angie Chamberlain worked with us on and said, yep, you're good to go. You don't need to go to planning board for this. But as we um, use the, the um, generous donation, I'd like the kids and Lynn Hanna's um, pretty excited about this too. She's got some ideas um, and we would like to, sorry, 
we would like to um, be able to use that money and go through the planning board process and the actual design, et cetera, with the kids. Let's see. Barb, I had a question. Uh, Lily, did you have any? Or Dwayne? No. Nope. Okay. Um, my question is just a small one. Um, the summer school um, figure, do you attribute that because of COVID and what we're going through that we need, that we were sort of, it looks like we were over budget? Yes. Yeah, you're picking up on exactly that. So Robin, Sue, so last year um, we offered summer school because of being out um, to people who wanted it. The only way we could offer it, of course, was virtually, which meant that we were doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which meant that we needed more hours than what we had. So that's what we're anticipating again. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions for Barb? I don't see any. Oh, no, Christy. Um, so Barb, when do we have to have this budget to council? Can we, do we vote on it? Are you suggesting we vote on it in the first week of January or we have, do we have another meeting in December coming up? I, I would propose that we have another meeting on the 21st because okay. other, you need to have the budget to Cornell on the 4th. And so okay. it really wouldn't give you time. I can check that. I'll check that, I'll double check that timeline again with Cornell and make sure it's not later than that. Um, if it is, if it's after the fourth or if he's gonna give us leeway, then you could wait until your first meeting in January. Okay, but that gives us time to see the AOS budget again. And also I think a chance to see the high school budget because even though it's not part of this budget, it does obviously affect our whole town assessment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. as I've said to Cornell, you know, I mean, it is hard to put a budget together, you know, when you're basically 10 months out before the, you know, vote. Um, and we will adjust it accordingly as we can up until March, you know, so we could, we can adjust the budget up until March 25th, I think, is the, the uh, meeting that they have scheduled. Um, but we obviously want to give them the best information that we can also at the time. And I, I almost feel like I'd, I'd rather see us go a little high so that they can plan accordingly and then hopefully we can adjust down. I'd hate to be coming back and asking for more money. Yeah, I don't. I really don't see coming back and asking for more money as an option ever, to be honest. I mean, I right. think, you know, unless really there's a catastrophic, is. yeah, right. unless there's something catastrophic, I, I think um, that's a hard thing to do because the town doesn't have a, pot of money to necessarily go through either. Right. Uh, Mark? Did you have your hand up, Mark? Oh, you're on mute. I will just add real quickly that we do not have the CIP as part of this budget. So we would have it for either the 21st or the 4th, Christy. I apologize, Robin Sue. Um, my, my screen cut out. Um, I just wanted to um, let everybody know that we're probably looking for meetings this year. Just forecasting, I was talking to not Cornell, but another town manager and um, we're, we're probably looking at, as Barb indicated, uh, doing this for some time. So we're exploring what our options are gonna be remotely. And um, so in-person meetings for the spring even may not happen. We hope they do, but just wanna put it out there that we might have to go through the same round that we did last year. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Marie? Barb, um, when, when is the bus contract up? Are we in the final year of it? Or you say we have one more year, which is 21, 22? I am thinking this is five out of five. Let's see, mm, let me look at my notes. Barb, I th you have one more year, correct, Nancy? Yeah, you have one more year yeah. uh, after this year. Right. You're, we're in year four, correct, Nancy? Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that, and that's what I'm saying is that we have, yeah. And so is next year when we would be 
I know I was here for when we did it before, but I think it might've been my first year. So I don't recall the details, but so in theory is next year when we would put out bids. I think the school year mm -hmm. is when we put out the bid. Yeah. And, and the school committee last time, Barb, correct, correct me if I'm wrong or Nancy, <clears throat> um, both uh, Bar Harbor and Trenton agreed to do a joint bid, which actually worked out um, in, a, in a positive for, for everyone. So that opportunity will be there um, again, if that's the direction you want to go in. And so just to follow up, um, in the years past, it's like what the, all, all three of the other, so Tr uh, Tremont and Southwest and Mount Desert all have their own bus drivers and have never entered into a contract like this. Correct. That's correct, yeah. Um, and, yes. And every year, the, last year, they all had the opportunity to do that? No, um, I, they, they've had their own transportation services, but we've never invited the other communities or at least uh, in the time that I've been here, um, the, no one has expressed an interest in going in that direction. Except for- um, Trenton. Trenton. Yep. Correct. So um, the, I guess I'm just would be, I, I'm looking forward to learning about this transportation director position and how it might be different or maybe it's the same and what, what it covers and what it's taking off plates and things like that. Because if a huge, I, I completely hear what Barb is saying in terms of in general, something we can't control is whether or not there are actually bus drivers that can actually, that are out there, you know, driving for these larger companies that, you know, can help us be as efficient as we are. Um, but I think it's still important to, I mean, I really want to know what's, what's in that for that position, because if we, if you can make up a story that there was some way that there was contracted services throughout the island and you didn't, you know, have to have principals, um, driving buses and, you know, the things and struggling to manage um, a bus driver in the morning and turning them into a, you know, whatever they're else are doing in the afternoon, then it would seem like that would take a huge chunk of work out of managing buses. Well, I, if I may make no mistake about it, I think Barb would be and Mike Zabore both would be the first to step up and say, look, it's made our life easier or, um, I shouldn't say that. Uh, we've been able to focus in other areas. There's no question because uh, the logistics of what SEER does, and they've done a great job for us, and all the resources are a blessing. I think Barb would say that, and Mike would say that, and Barb jump in after I'm done. But at the end of the day, Barb Neely and Mike Zabore still have to take time, or whoever they designate, to liaise with, with SEER over issues fingerprinting, you, you name it. And State that's report. time out of our principal and assistant principal, the educational leaders of our building that, um, again, I'm not trying to push anything. I just want to put it into context. And we will have that conversation because by tomorrow evening, the, the school board um, and Marie, you're asking great questions. We'll have a um, draft job description that will show what this position entails. In addition, it'll show some comparables in terms of similar demographics uh, positions. And um, so I think it's important, but like anything else, this has implications too for Nancy Thurlow and a lot of others in terms of reports that are required, regardless of whether we contract out or not. And, um, you know, I, I'm really conscious about anytime we come forward with a new request and um, what that entails for, for each community. Uh, there's always going to be give and take on these types of positions, just like your superintendent, just like Julie Meltzer, our special education director. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's really important if we're gonna go down this road that, we able to, that, that we're able to quantify what the position does or doesn't do, and that we're accountable each and every year. Um, so uh, I, um, I look forward to that conversation because this is not going to benefit the AOS central office. This is going to ultimately benefit kids because we're going to be giving time back to our principals and to 
people that are working to support our principals. Thank you. I just want to clarify, I wasn't trying to suggest that the principals would have nothing to do with the buses anymore just because we had a transportation director, but I think I think that I've seen um, the the way that it's made things more efficient for Connors Emerson and the, the shifting of the things that Barb and Heather and, um, and uh, Taylor work on, they're still working on transportation, but it's really shifted. It's not down to the nitty gritty of like, literally, should, mm -hmm. I drive, should I get in the bus and start driving? It's, you know, it's, it's more like upper echelon things, which are just as, you know, mind boggling and frustrating, but it just, it, I, I feel as though it's really added to the efficiencies. They're still gonna have, um, obviously tons of things to do with, with transportation, but I just feel like at the elemental level, if they're not having to worry about hopping in behind the bus and like figuring out how to get kids, you know, it's important to think about having them have a little, a little higher level, maybe sometimes, or more um, logistical support um, than, than that elemental support of like being able to actually get kids to where they're supposed to be. So it's done a lot of efficiencies for Connors Emerson. And I, we talk about efficiencies all the time for the AOS. Um, we talk about it, the inefficiencies of the AOS a lot. So I think it's important to think about those little things, the systems we already have in place that could be expanded just as much as it is important to talk about the new systems we might need to be putting in place that aren't there yet. That's it. Christy. I just want to go back to the, you know, I think it was before you got here, Mark, we did uh, have an AOS wide conversation about, about having a contract about everybody moving to a contract or, or, I, we've had this transportation director conversation before and about managing the buses from one, you know, one central spot, you know, the high school could combine routes. We don't need separate buses for every town at the high school level. Um, and a lot of those other towns that have their own buses were, were opposed to joining in because they, they had the belief, they had had bus drivers for 20 years. And, and the story was, you know, the bus driver knew all the kids' names and knew the route and looked out for the kids. And, you know, some of those schools had bought new buses or had built maintenance facilities. But, you know, years have gone by since we had that discussion. And I think more and more of those smaller towns are, are struggling. You know, they've lost those long-term bus drivers to retirement or, or whatnot, and they're struggling with their bus system. And I think now that we're on the last year of this contract, we it might be um, like priority number one for the new transportation person to see if all these towns can revisit that issue. Because, you know, with Barb saying that SEER might not be interested, they might be more interested if they were looking at five schools and a system-wide contract than they would be, you know, for just two schools. Um, and so I, I definitely think where we are right now, it's time to you know, ramp up that conversation again about, about whether or not those other schools wanna get on board this contract with us. I, I agree, Re regardless of where the position or the requested position does or doesn't go, we need to continue this conversation. Thank you. And I, I'd also add too, to the, if anybody's looking, I mean, my son is in eighth grade and he has had the same bus driver you know, through Sear, the entire time he's been in school. She knows his name, she knows us, we wave, we say hello, we exchange Christmas cookies. I mean, and so the idea that a contract makes your bus drivers unstable is not necessarily true either. I mean, I know we've been fortunate on, on our bus route to have this stable driver the whole time, but it is possible. And, and I think a lot of our drivers, some of them live on the island. And so it's, it's not unheard of that the, some of the drivers who are still interested in driving could also still be driving with a SEER contract and working for SEER. And so, you know, it, it could be beneficial in, in many ways, you know, for the other schools too. My, my oldest daughter has, still has the same bus driver. She got her back in high school. So she's the same person, kindergarten, picked her up first day of kindergarten. She drops her off every day that she's in school for ninth grade. So talk about continuity. It's yeah. It's, it, it was a little rocky, I will say, when we first started, um, but I could not be happier with who we have right now. We, we um, have a new bus driver on, on routes A and routes um, D, as in dog, but um, I will also say that in general, the, 
the people traveling from Old Town, the drivers traveling from Old Town do like working with us. And I'll tell you, we, we were one of the few schools last spring that paid our drivers when they weren't working. And we insisted upon that with SEER um, because it was the right thing to do. We were paying our ed techs, we were paying our drivers, we were paying you know, custodians, et cetera. And that, that really made an impact on our drivers. Um, in addition to what we've been doing you know, previously to that too, is just treating them right and um, things like that. But, but it's still, you know, you've got people traveling from Old Town down because we can't get local drivers for all four runs. Okay. Are there any other questions about the budget? I don't think I see any. So I guess we're on to action items. Is this a mark thing or a I think I think it's a mark thing. I'll, okay. I'll start off by uh, just um, giving some context. So this is a, um, it, it's an action item, but not a new item. Uh, this is a request uh, for the school committee's uh, consideration and approval of a memorandum of understanding for our school resource officer. Um, the past several years, we've brought this forward as a annual review of the um, MOU. Uh, for context, uh, myself and Chief Willis have reviewed this. Uh, Barb has been involved in those conversations as well as Matt Haney and Gloria Del Sandro. Um, the way this works is that because each town chooses to have a resource officer or, or has in the past, we bring this forward to um, the Mount Desert School Committee, the Bar Harbor School Committee, and the high school board. And um, simply put, we've had a great relationship with um, the Bar Harbor Police Department and, and all of our departments. I believe we're blessed to have the personnel that we have in place. Um, and I would... Um, recommend that we continue that. But more importantly, I think you need to hear from Barb as principal um, in terms of what the position has or hasn't done for kids and staff. Thank you. Barb, do you want to add anything to that? Um, you know, we continue to enjoy our relationship, working relationship with Tim. I think, um, you know, it's a different relationship, certainly this year because of the COVID than it has been in the past. But I, I just think it's positive to see, you know, that there's another adult resource in the school. Um, and he does a nice job going out and, you know, working with the kids, you know, usually at playground time, um, lunches, he reads to them. Um, and they, they do seek him out when they want to ask some questions. Um, and so, you know, I just, it's so, and I don't know how, I, I don't know how you delineate from, from, um, what the stereotypical school resource officer, you know, in, in the, the dress uniform, in the bulletproof vest, you know, kids going through metal detectors, not developing relationships, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's so atypical of what we have. And I go back to when I was, you know, like a summer brat, you know, on the island. I mean, I was just amazed at, you know, my local friends would go up and say to a Hiley Hall, how are you doing? Or, you know, to, um, to, to you know, any of the, the police in Bar Harbor. I mean, it was, it's a cultural thing. It's part of our community that our police department develops um, relationships with kids. And I, and I would hate to lose that. So I'm all in favor of this. Are there any questions, Lily? Just a quick one. Um, I read this one, but I didn't connect it to my, oh, sorry, I don't know what I did. Um, I didn't connect it or reread the other one, but it, to me, it seems like it's written exact, it's exactly the same thing, just with a different, so we've, we've already enjoyed this contract. We, we review it, yeah. we okay. review it annually. And so we bring it back to the school committee each year after we review it. 
And that is correct. There are no amendments or changes um, as recommended. I have Christy and then Marie. Um, first off, I'd say that I 100% I support this position of the school resource officer, especially here at Connors Emerson, but I don't want to, um, to not be listening uh, to the, to the public and and obviously we all know what we went through this summer with the uh, anti-racism task force and the the uh, the Bar Harbor Teachers Association specifically writing us a letter saying that they all stood behind the uh, petition which called for the removal of the school resource officer and I, I believe it's my understanding from um, talking to people at the high school, that those kids involved in the anti-racism task force have, have, I believe, changed their views on Officer Tim at the high school level based upon conversations with Matt and Ingrid and, 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 and I think are supportive of continuing that relationship. So I don't know, Mark, if you can give, I don't know if we have any more feedback on that, but I just wanted <laughs> to say like, I'm not, I just want to say publicly that I'm, I'm not disregarding um, those statements made by our teachers back in June. And I sure. really wish we had some, you know, maybe our Farb can, can follow up. Have you had conversations with staff and, and do you feel that they would support us continuing this contract with, I, I, I am supportive, but I, I don't want to move forward as if we're not hearing the statements that were made six months ago. Right. And but, all I can tell you is I, I truthfully, Christy have not pulled the staff. Um, and see if they still feel that way. I think they were heavily influenced by wanting to support the students. But I will also say that, you know, the, the school resource officer is program is only as good as the school resource officer in it. You know, this could be a very different conversation if, you know, Tim Bland wasn't our school resource officer. Number one, he was an educator or had education background prior to going into the police um, force. So, I mean, he, you know, he understands kids um, and he's not looking to jam them up. And, and of course, Jim Willis as police chief, you know, is supportive of that approach. So I think it's always good to review it, you know, on a regular basis, because really, if any of those players change, you could be looking at something very different. Mark, do you want to add to it? Not a whole lot, but uh, a couple of pieces. Number one, um, absolutely unequivocally, um, the person um, in the position is going to be key. And in this case, I think everything that's been said about Tim and the department, I agree with. But at the end of the day, it's important to keep it in, this into context. It doesn't matter whether or not Barb Neely or Mark Gauss or Jim Willis or Tim Bland or Heather Webster or anybody else is there. There's an out clause. And that is at any time, if the school committee or the police department or an entity believes that this isn't working, you can pull out at any time. You, you do not need to continue this. This isn't like a Supreme Court appointment. It's, a, it's an annual review. And we've had some, some good successes. But to the point you made, Christy, and I agree with, and uh, I don't want to digress too much, but because I think we'll have this, I know we'll have this conversation at the high school level. Um, it's going to be important for Matt Haney as the principal and Julie Meltzer to talk about the work that's been done with the anti-racism task force, where their priorities are. And um, I don't know of anybody who's ever said anything in a way that's less than positive about Tim Bland. So I wanna put that into context right away. I think there are some questions by many and rightly so about whether or not police officers in our school or law enforcement are the right approach. And, you know, I think we have to come back to being open to feedback and also defining um, that piece that Barb said, that one word, and that's relationships. I've worked with a lot of resource officers and I can tell you both as a superintendent and principal, it's, I've had to say, not here, but in other places, it's not working out. That person is not right. And I'm I'm 100% behind that. That'd be no different than if we had a superintendent that wasn't a good fit or anybody else. So I think it's important that we keep that conversation going, that we keep the feedback open and um, 
so I, I would hope that the school committee would feel comfortable moving forward, knowing full well that this is a, a conversation that's open, open all the time. Thank you. Marie. Um, I just wanted to kind of scoot back to the actual memorandum and just remind folks, if, if, if folks are listening or just to refresh us, is that we, I don't know when it was three years ago, maybe two years ago, when we had very long um, and passionate discussions we had about the role of the school resource officer in our, in our schools and about the memorandum of understanding, which at that point was really light and it was not necessarily um, a working, um, a, a document that worked for us because it didn't really define the roles. It left open too much for people to really look and say, what, what actually is this person doing? And so I just wanna remind everyone that we have this a much better memorandum of understanding that really outlines the rules and the roles and the responsibilities and more importantly of the authority um, for the school and who sort of is, um, or how exactly if there is anything that happens in the school, who the, who the authorities are and those are the building principles. Um, so that document is probably the polar opposite of the one that was first presented to us many three or four years ago when there were so many discussions in the community about it. And I think this document really was built with community input. There was retired lawyers on this committee. It was a community-based committee to, to reconstruct this document. And I think that's why it's so, it's, it, it really works for us today. Um, it took into account a lot of things that people were worried about, especially about civil rights um, and, and whether or not, you know, what were the, the roles and responsibilities of the SRL. So I think that's one important thing for us to remember as we continue the conversations that we did a lot of really hard work on the MOU that we're talking about tonight to make sure that it works for our community as well. Not just about the person, but that the MOU and what that person is supposed to be doing works for our community as well, so. Thanks, Marie. Are there any other questions or a motion? Christy? I don't, I don't have the, the paper right in front of me, the agenda, but I would move that uh, we accept the memorandum of, a, of agreement with the uh, Bar Harbor Police Department for our school resource officer. For, do I have to say for the 21, 2021 year, school year? Is there a second? Second. Is there any? Discussion. All right. I, I just have a question. I, I saw yeah. Tim the first couple of days of school. It's always fun to see him. He opens the door and ushers the kids out. Is he able to be? Is he able to be in the classrooms now? Much these days, Barb, or what? I mean, it, with everything else is going on, or um, he he will go down the hall and and stick his head in and say hi, but he's mostly confined to the office. Um, and he does um, actually read for on the virtual um, programs for Marsha and for um, Amber and, and stuff. So yeah. he's also done some outdoor lunch duties and outdoor recess duties yes, so, yeah. um, and helped a lot with either arrivals he, or uh, dismissals. He was on campus at the high school today um, when the kids were in passing and doing, doing their lunch and he was engaging with kids there, physically distanced and masked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, he was before he went over, so it's it's nice to have him in the building. All right. So, oh, we can will... I just inter interject yep. one thing? And, and it's you know, um, a parent sought him out. Um, there, there was you know a custody issue brewing, and the parent saw Tim on the school grounds and asked um, to connect with him. And they had a great conversation. So I think sometimes it's not only just our students, but it's also that connection that parents feel like if my kid can trust this guy, then then I need to be able to trust him. And, and you know, he's another resource for me. Nice, thanks. All right. Robin, can I say one thing really quickly? Yes, Julie, there you are. Yes, now I see you. Um, so Christy, you asked about um, whether there had been conversations and discussions with the high school, with the students. And there were some initial conversations with some of the students when we were coming up with the charter for the anti-racism task force. There have not been conversations since then, although we are about to 
Um, one of the three priorities chosen by the task force is to look at um, how we are dealing with uh, incidents of um, racial bias and, and racial prejudice. Um, so I think it, it's gonna come up again. I would just say that at the time, two very clear statements were made. One was around support of the students. The other was around the fact that um, students of color or teachers of color or staff of color who come from other places are traumatized by having law enforcement in the school. I am not saying this to cause any problems. I'm saying this because I just want to have the record straight that that is, those were the two clear feelings that were conveyed this summer at the time. So I, I just want that there and it may turn out that as the conversation continues that people are not, don't feel that or that um, people feel having heard about some of the history that Marie shared, which I think is really important for people to understand um, that there'll be a different feeling about it. But I just want to make sure that's been said for the record. Okay, thanks, Julie. Let's see, I think, I don't see any more hands. I think we're ready to vote. Lily. I approve. Marie. Approve. Dwayne. Approve. Christine. Approve. And Robin Sue, I approve. So that's unanimous. Thank you all. Thanks. That was and fun. I never get to make motions at these meetings. I know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mark, Robin was there Sue, any more? Yes. I, I apologize. I did check with Selena um, a, a few moments ago and uh, no public comment that we have at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other business from anybody? I think I just had a question about um, back to the teacher testing. Have we had a, um, any teachers opt out of the testing? We've had employees from across the AOS um, that have said no, they, they don't want, they would not want to participate for various reasons. Sure. Uh, some, you know, um, a, a variety of reasons, but I would say it's a, it's a very, very small percentage. And um, we believe that we have a very, very healthy cross section of individuals and, and wide participation. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, a shout out to our employees and in these uncertain times, because I believe they recognize the value of this resource. So um, I, I wouldn't want to put out a number, but it's, it's a very small number, Robinson. Okay. And I'm Thank very you. confident um, that the staff see the value and will support this. Barb, please add anything if you would like to. No, I think you said it well. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, if anything, employees um, are overly um, thankful and appreciative that they have this opportunity where many of their colleagues in different parts of the state or even in other states you know, this is, this is unheard of really. So. Right. Robin Sue. Yes. Can I add one thing just because there's an open sure. audience and I sure. want Barb to jump in. Cause we were talking about this and we're, we're going into this knowing full well that, you know, um, our school has seen uh, a couple of positive cases um, that it's elevated our region and nobody should be shocked if we come away from our initial benchmark and identify some cases, not saying we will, but nobody should be, should be shocked. And that's actually a good thing because that's what the program is designed to do. So we hope that's not the case, but I wouldn't want, you know, fear and pandemonium to be uh, running amok because that's, this program is designed to see if we have any evidence of spread so we can be proactive. Um, Barb, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think, I think that's the, you know, one of the marking points of our um, district is that we do try to be proactive and we do try to be incredibly supportive of our staff. 
Um, and so I'm just pleased that we were able to finally, you know, that we were able to get this done. And I know Mark as a superintendent in Hancock County, a lot of the superintendents are wondering, you know, how you were able to pull this off when they don't have the resources that we have, um, you know, with the lab and with the hospital and with the bank all working together. I mean, we have an amazing community and we just need to keep being reminded of that at times when, you know, we're all feeling defeated, but boy, if, if we're going through a pandemic, there's no other community I would rather be in, no other state. I mean, we even surpassed Hawaii guys. We're now second in the nation for Lois. Haven't beat <laughs> Vermont yet, but we surpassed Hawaii and they check you at the door. You know, if you fly in, you get checked into a hotel room for two weeks. So we're good. Marie? I just had a question about the, um, and you may have already addressed this at some other point. Is there any other school district in the state elementary school, high school, that's doing an asymptomatic testing program. I listened to Dr. Shaw today and he talked a lot about schools and sort of just like oh. Mark said, kind of put things into perspective that of how we're, how great we're at, even though it's, we've had these upticks in Maine where we're, you know, percentage points below even, you know, 90% or 99% of the other states in the, in the country. But um, I was wondering, I, I don't know if you talked about that before, whether or not there's another program in Maine that's like this. So uh, if I, Robin Sue, can I respond? Yeah, please go so, ahead. Um, uh, sadly, this is not widespread like uh, COVID in many parts of the country. Um, I think we're the envy of many school districts. In short, I wanna be careful. I'm not aware of, of any other um, public school system, K through 12 that does this with the exception of Westbrook. Um, and Westbrook was doing a program through a grant through the city. But I believe, and this is where I want to be careful, I believe their, their funding ends at the end of the month. So, you know, I guess what I'd say is if that's accurate, we're picking up where they may be leaving off. Um, this, I can't emphasize enough how valuable this resource is in concert with the other things we're doing. But no, Marie, I'm not aware of any other school district outside of what Westbrook was doing previously um, out, outside of us uh, that, that's doing this in the state of Maine. There may be somebody out there, but not that I'm aware of. All right, thanks, Mark. Let's see, um, so other business? I think I saw head shaking going on that there wasn't anything else. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything. Okay. And future agenda items. I think just continue on the budget and maybe an update um, finalized of uh, the COVID money that ends December 30th and how we deployed it. Okay. All right. And next meeting date on here says January 4th, but you're thinking December 21st, correct? I'm gonna, um, I just sent out, thank you. I just sent out an email to Cornell asking if we could pass the budget, school budget in on January 5th, um, with the reason being that it would allow you folks to have an AOS meeting um, and a high school meeting and, and hear a little bit more. So okay. if he okays the January 5th deadline, then I think we can just move to January 4th unless you wanna meet after um, the AOS or high school meeting on the 21st. So Christy and I can discuss it. Okay, sounds good. All right, and if there's nothing else, I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Dwayne. Have a good holiday, you guys.